Oh, we're live. What hey. happened to the fancy countdown? Oh, we didn't. We weren't. We were late. We're actually live right now. Good yes. morning. Hi, everyone. Uh oh. Where's Aurelia? <laughs> hey, everyone. Well, good morning. I guess uh, the stick got handed to me all of a sudden <laughs> to fly the plane. So welcome to our Sunday morning service. Aurelia popped out. Now she's back. I just got kicked. I got lost off the connection. Me too. That was weird. Wait, who else did that happen to? Me. Oh. It was like glitch the stream yard or something. We got booted out. I really hope that doesn't happen in the middle of Matt's sermon. But if it does, you can go back to listen to it from 20, I don't know what year you preached it. We are in our From the uh, from the Archives series. Good morning, everybody. Um, you'll hear more about the sermon series in just a little bit, but we are, we're bringing back old favorites or maybe not so favorites and bringing new life into them. So we'll hear from Matt on that in a little bit in which sermon he chose. Good morning. I see Jana in the chat. Good morning, good Jana morning. and Clark. Y'all, our first two people to say good morning have are sick and have COVID. Right. And um, if they can be here, just kidding. We don't <laughs> shame. <laughs> um, prayers for, for you guys. I hope you're yeah. feeling okay. Uh, we have several people down and out. It's going around again. So I hope everyone is doing their best to stay safe and, you know, navigate this once again. Um, there's Lyle with the cowboy emoji. Say good morning in the chat. Hey, Naomi, Tiffany, Sharon. It's good to see y'all. Um, good. Clark says so far he feels like a light cold. So, so grateful to hear you're doing okay. Um, if you have communion elements, please do share in the comments. This is one of our favorite and honestly, the high point in our gatherings together is communion every week, whether we're in person or online. We love to center this moment of coming to the metaphorical table together. All are welcome here. And online, we like to choose our own elements. So what do y'all have going on here today? Peanut butter pretzels. Peanut butter pretzels. Yes. Nice. Anyone else? Cherry surprise. Cherry surprise. Right. Did some wait? Who just said what? I said cherry, cherry surprise. surprise. <laughs> oh, <laughs> did someone just hold up a grape? Yes, that was me. Grape and coffee. <laughs> good, good, solid choice. Miles, what did you yeah. hold up there? Three musketeers. Yes, oh, I thought yes. I saw a goldfish as well. Yep, that was mine. Matthew, what is it? I have um, a piece of a cookie from a neighbor, so neighbor cookies, and uh, coffee in a mug that I stole from a job when I was mad at them and I quit. <laughs> Matt, for those who don't know, Matt always has a, a story behind his mugs. Um, so I like neighbor cookies. That sounds good. Yeah. Matt, neighbor cookies cannot beat breakfast tacos in the state of Texas. Um, right. I'm thinking abundance here. Um, made for you. And yeah, they were made that, for me as that well. That is an important fact. There. Yes. So, you know, neighbor cookies or best friend breakfast tacos. I don't know. Um, anyways. Okay, let's see. Clark has banana and Woodford Reserve double oaked bourbon. Okay. <laughs> Clark, Clark, you're doing good. Um Okay, we're going to share some announcements. Y'all get your communion elements if you have not gotten the point. <laughs> That's what we're talking about right now. Also, the worship guide is available. We will pin it in the comments. So if you would like to follow along with the order of worship, um, please do so. That way you can find it and everything that we're going to be going over today together. Um, and then I'm going to go over some announcements uh, in the life of our community. We have a new book group starting this week. In fact, this one's a special one because the author of it is our very own Dr. David Hawley, who's a beloved person just like everyone else in our community. He wrote a book called Changing Your Mind Without Losing Your Faith. And he is actually going to lead the book group. So please go get that or order it um, if you haven't already. 
you can read the first section. He's broken it up into four and um, you can read that and join us for the book group on Tuesday in person and um, message us if you need more details. But the best thing to do is get on our email list. That's really how you find out about everything. Okay, another uh, group is meeting up this week. We have a meetup for Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the peace community meeting at the Ruby Bar on Wednesday, July 20th. Again, um, check our social media to keep updated with that, but also get on our email list or reach out to us and we'll tell you how to get all that information. Another cool thing coming up is our kids retreat. It's for ages three through 10, and it's going to be on Friday, July 29th. And all the pastors are going to be leading it as well as help from volunteers and some of our junior deacons, I think as well. So we are going to um, have a lot of fun that day and it's not too late to join us. Um, I think there's a link for that somewhere. But again, I think you need to get on our email list because we tend to not share um, the kids stuff widely. We try to keep that a little bit more um, private. Okay, feel free to say hello in the comments. We want to hear from you. We're looking forward to moving into this space together. I'm going to lead us in the chiming of the hour this morning. And um, we do the chiming of the hour every single week, whether we're in person or online. Um, we do this as a way to move into the worship space and this morning, I wanted to share a quote with you from a book that I've been reading the last few months. It's an, a really incredible book that I haven't finished yet, but I highly recommend. It's called This Here Flesh by Cole Ar Ar Arthur Riley. And um, I think we have, I think, yeah, we have it up here so I can actually read it this way. So I'm going to read this quote. It's a little bit of an excerpt. It maybe uh, is a better way to describe it. And this is about dignity. So this morning, I'm going to read the excerpt, and then I'm going to chime the hour 10 times to mark the hour. And I just want to invite you to set your intention for the morning, but also think about your inherent dignity in your Imago Dei and how loved and um, you are by our Creator God. So this is from This Here Flesh by Cole Arthur Riley. When Eve and Adam eat from the tree <clears throat> and decay and despair begin to creep in, when they learn to hide from their own bodies, when they learn to hide from each other. No one ever told me the story of a God who kneels and makes clothes out of animal skin for them. I remember many conversations about the doom and consequence imparted by God after humans ate from that tree. I learned of the curses too, and could maybe even recite them but no one ever told me of the tenderness of this moment. It makes me question everything that surrounds it. In the garden, when shame had replaced Eve's and Adam's dignity, God became a seamstress, a seamstress. He took the skin off of his creation to make something that would allow humans to stand in the presence of their maker and one another again. Good morning, morning, peace kids. I am Jessica, and I'm going to do the kids sermon today. I have a story for you. So one night when my daughter Micah was about six years old, it was bedtime. And we're doing our bedtime routine. We brush teeth. We get our PJs on. We read a book. We listen to a podcast. And on this particular night, Micah said, I don't want to go to school tomorrow. And I said, why don't you want to go to school? 
She said, I don't want to leave you and I don't like it there and I don't have any friends and I don't like it and I don't like my teacher and I don't want and I want you and I want you all the time. And she cried and cried and cried. I gave her a cuddle and I let her cry until she got a bunch of it out. And then I said, what if you create a friend to go to school with you, to keep you company, help you feel safe and not alone? And Micah said, what do you mean? And I said, well, when I was a girl, I had a best friend who I invented. I created her in my mind. She ate dinner with us went to school with me, played with me, and with her, I was never alone. And you could imagine an animal, a person, or even a place where you feel safe. So what's your favorite animal? And Micah said, well, dogs, of course. Micah has always claimed that she's half dog because we have a lot of them in our family. Well, why don't you make up a dog friend or a pack of dogs and they will keep you company and protect you. So Micah imagined a pack of five dogs who were named Fluffy, Muffy, Duffy, Buffy, and Mo. And this pack of dogs traveled with her everywhere for a while. I often, I often call on a wise old woman with gray hair and she walks with a cane and I call her grandmother. She meets me in my imagination in a clearing in the forest. She keeps me company and helps me remember that I am strong, beautiful, and wise. So kids, I want you to close your eyes and take a deep breath all the way down to your toes. Imagine a place that is comfortable to you, a place where you feel so safe. When you're in your safe place in your mind, sit down. And after a moment, a being comes to you. It could be a person, an animal, or something from nature, anything. It's totally up to you and your imagination. And if no one comes to you now, give it a while and don't worry. Your friend may come in a dream or while you're playing or while you're just playing today. I'm going to be quiet for a moment and give you a chance to get to know each other. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. I know that was super short, but you can be in that place and with your friend anytime you want. If you choose, I invite you to create a picture or something to remember your friend. Good morning. Reverend Christopher here and have an opportunity to reflect on communion. So as we invited earlier, if you haven't gotten your communion elements, uh, please take a moment to do so. The first thing to me that comes to mind here is about community and how big of a word that is and how much meaning is impacted there. The, the Greek of the koinonia, the depth that's involved there, just so, sort of the mystery there of just studying that word or trying to uh we're, what we're experiencing this weekend having some good friends come in from hours away to have community with us and uh, here with us this morning and Britt and kate good to have you again so and the community that romans 12 2 we're inviting folks in to heal to uh to to, to restore and one of our leaders there his quote is we're wounded in community yet we need community to heal and how precious this community has been for us in that regard in in many ways and reflecting on fellowship and community in regards to this pilgrimage we were uh, blessed to take and to uh, enjoy in the, the 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 unity that was 
there in the Camino, the, the almost transcendent, well, to me, it was transcendent unity, the beauty and the, and the spirit of the, of the Camino, the, the camaraderie there, the various uh, skin shades and colors and, and backgrounds and genders and, and nationalities and, and languages that were spoken. It was, it was, it was beautiful. And it was uh, the arduousness of it, the, uh, the trail that was uh, to be taken on here and, and, and what was still unknown as much as uh, we read books and watched movies and, and had uh, testimonials come all our way. There was still frontier. There were still unknowns. And there was many times along the way we were like, wow, we thought we knew what we were going to get, get into and, and, and we didn't yet. There was community in many, in many ways we didn't. And it was tough uh, yet. There was such this sense of, of community and, there's various uh, drop-in points uh, where you start and, and time frames that, that, it, that you're going to be on it. And, and for 500 miles, typically, the, most of them are going to walk. 80% of the uh, pilgrims are walking. So it's over, uh, you, uh, they start over, you know, they start at, at certain points, but it takes over 30 days on average. Um, bikers, you know, about two weeks, which is about the time frame that we did it in, about 15 days. Um but there's different drop-in points because not of course not everybody can get off for three weeks this was the first time for us nobody not many folks can get off on uh, for a month or or whatever the time frame is and and so you find people in transitions you find people coming out of oftentimes wounded situations where they have they have they're taking sabbatical they're being vo very focused on the time to be there uh you have folks that are uh, uh forced transitions like part of my story in 2012 separation divorce and being in the lowest point of my life and having uh you know, isolating more in that time frame but we have folks that were on the trail that were were moving into a, a greater community pushing themselves to try to to find that community if they didn't have it making room for um, something new in their life and it was a beautiful thing and at the same time, as we're moving further into this, we have other drop in points that are closer to the, the end where we were where we were heading the, the arrival point where everybody's uh, moving towards is the uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the proposed burial side of St. James. And so there was this moment after all this, uh, you know, sort of transcends again, the, the, the transcendence and the unity and the glory. And, and there was a moment where I was surrounded by uh, we were surrounded by hills and rolling hills and mountains. And it was so green and it was gorgeous. It was so lush and all the blue skies. And the, it was about day five or six. And my legs were killing me. We were just hurting. We were just trying to just go to the next little step, as it were. And this time bike, you know, the next little pedal. So I'm just looking down and focused on the very next couple of inches and then there was this time where I, I, I looked up and when I looked up I had been pondering and, and, and thinking about these type of things and Ezzy and the grief and the connection there with other bereaved parents and just our family and just how well the family had done through so many challenges that had come our way already by that time and I was just weeping and it was almost an uncontrollable weep it was just such a transcendent connection there it was beautiful <laughs> And I laugh because now what's coming is death flesh down the line where these drop ins were, were less than 100 miles away from our end point. And the, the, the trail up to that point hadn't been very populated. And at this juncture, uh, we were all on the same trail. Uh, often, m most of the time you had a bike trail, so you had some separation between the hiker. But in this particular time, we had these folks that came in that were and their new duds and they were looking clean and fresh and you know we we're by then a week and a half in and just looking pretty ragged you know in the same clothes that we've been in primarily and and my flesh was like at first at first it was still spiritual it was still a uh, bin camino bin camino and it was just so inviting but then it was like number after number of persons in front of us and sort of in the way and we had to slow way down and i could feel my flesh rising up in this moment and it was you know basically get out of the way. Like, what do you people get? You know, we've been paying a, a bigger price. We've been sacrificing more and y'all should make way for us, you know? And it was, it was actually a fleeting moment. It was time where I would, various times in my life, I would stay in that longer. Uh, this particular time I didn't, but being able to capture it and be able to be okay with that as well as part of my um, uh, experience and in, in, in growth, I believe, 
in maturity and in in, in in Christ and in, in humanity and just being around the Imago Day, which is so well represented in this community and and seeing divinity in others, no matter how they are expressing it or not expressing it or not aware of it, has been so incredibly helpful in my recovery and my uh, wounded heart becoming more whole. And one of the things about communion and this, this gathering and, and, and the first supper, the Lord's Supper, is the, the thoughts of, you know, how well do we know his associates? You know, this thought of you're known by your associates, right? You're known by the company you keep. Uh, are, are you sometimes perhaps guilty by association? You know, some of the challenges that have come my, come my way with that, the, you know, if, uh, if, uh, if the, for example, it was told to me, it, it was, uh, if, I, if, if, if DTS, Dallas Theological, knew that I was part of this community, I wouldn't have been allowed in. Perhaps that's right, perhaps not, but it's, uh, it's, it's part of this woundedness, it's part of this, these challenges of, well, uh, do we all have to think alike? The homogeny that's again very well represented here. You know, I, I think of the um, the can we name the twelve disciples? Right, that's uh, one of the communion uh, liturgies I've done here. Uh, that's been a challenge for me. Like I, I've studied those to try to even name them. Like we can't even. I couldn't even name them. How can I even know? more about their story and how come there's not more written yet you know as an an, an, an rabid a m fan over here and alumni and whatnot the football within the season i could i could i could name the 11 starters on probably both ways plus the head coach plus the the backup quarterback but i don't know the disciples i don't know their i don't even know their name so do i know their lives do i know their backgrounds do i know what they're thinking do i know where they've come from you know there's a current cynic out there that you know asks great questions and he's he's come from the religious background and theology and, and uh, a seminary and whatnot. And, and he asked his class uh, as a professor, he says, well, do you believe that God's all knowing? Do you believe he's all present? Yes, yes, yes. And he says, okay, well, remain standing, you know, stand up if that's true for you and remain standing if you've read all 66 books of the Bible and very few are standing up. And it's like, well, how, if you believe this, you would think you, how, how are you not exercising it and really getting background and, and challenging that? But how, my question again is how much of that is important how much do we need to know jesus was sitting down at the table at that last supper reclining and, and he wasn't just sitting like we're used to I'm, I'm used to sitting in chairs i still haven't reclined at a table that's near the ground and 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 bosom to bosom as the scripture talks about john was at his breast and holding him and and, and, and like men cuddling around the table like that's I haven't experienced that, you know, like yet it's in the in the scripture, you know, if we why 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 aren't we challenging ourselves there a bit more? And and, and again, some of the religious wounds and traumas that we've talked about here and that y'all again do such a good job of nurturing and, and, and challenging and working through. And one of mine in regards to uh, communion was a, a dear friend of mine who passed away and he a uh, Catholic background and we go to his funeral. And during the funeral, we were invited to communion. But we weren't unless you were a parishioner of that particular uh, parish, uh, you were not invited to communion. And it was just my spirit was I mean, y'all know to me, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of conflict. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, well, let's go, you know, but I'm at my buddy's funeral. Like, I mean, it, it took almost all I had to sit in there and not just go up as in defiance, you know, of this. Uh, I mean, it, it, to me, it was egregious, like. We're not invited to the to participate in the Lord's Supper at my friend's funeral. I, it it blew me away, and then it also got me thinking of um, my own. Did I cause some religious? Did I cause some religious trauma? Uh, our uncle Frankie passed away a couple of years ago, and I was asked to read some scripture at his funeral, and it was from a non um, canonized version of the of the scripture. It was uh, from First Maccabees, and he grew up. He was Catholic, and and it was presented to me as well. Well, this is his funeral. His his wishes. Can you just read it? And I was like. I really wanted to, I desired to, but I had this conflict of integrity with what I believe. And, and can I, can I read something that I don't believe? And I end up choosing not to do that and, and defer to it. And it was seemingly well uh, received with, uh, with the family, but it's, it's still a question. It's, did I cause some more uh, trauma there perhaps uh, wrestling with those kind of things? So as, as I, as we move towards the the liturgy here just in, in closing just some thoughts right some some things that i've been wrestling with is 
And, and again, this community does such a good job of is asking more questions and wondering and having a sense of curiosity and wonderment. And, and I've been looking much more into what Jesus is not doing or did not do. Right. As we as uh, Matthew is going to be covering here and, and talking about this, this man who was excised from his community. And, you know, and is this is this what he's dealing with, uh, you know, some literal uh, principalities and powers and rulers or or is it is it uh, sickness? Is it is it disease only? Is it both? And it, it, it's some wrestling, but he was not in community. And why not? And then why wasn't he invited back? So with me, again, what Jesus did not do was uh, he knew that he was at the table with a thief. He knew that he was he. He not only knew that he had given the purse to him. He'd given Judas uh, Iscariot the uh, treasury, right? He had invited him to to take care of what was going to uh, keep sustenance coming into them. And I, I just would I do that? Would I back to the guilty by association? Would I take such risk? Would I put myself or the quote, quote unquote my ministry or others in such risk? Uh, uh, other. Uh, uh, for community, for that kind of intimacy and, and depth. So uh, I just want to uh, you know, thank this community for, for inviting us in. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Huddle Bible, who invited me into leadership, knowing in, in this area that from my hometown and, and some of my background that there was uh, there was adultery, there was the divorce, there was alcoholism, you know, essentially being known as an a-hole, <laughs> you know, and in many regards, it's like, that's who you're going to have leading your men's ministry. And they stood by me and they stood up uh, for me. And it really meant a great deal. It was another aspect of healing and community. So as we, uh, uh, if you would, the uh, move towards grabbing your elements here and, um, and partaking. So liturgy of communion here. If I'll, re I'll start and if you'll join me in the bold. God is within you. God is also God is within, within you. you. Lift up your hearts. We join in the love of the community. Let us give thanks for the blessing of life. Together we raise our voices and gratitude. As we partake, that we will think of your body that is broken for all of us, no matter our background, no matter our done or we're going to do or what we're thinking it was broken and given to us you took on the sins of all the world past present and future you poured out your blood for us to be taking in whatever manner we take it in so that we can ponder and think about your sacrifice what it has taken and what it has, what the what the gate is for us to come into a community and lift your name on high thank you lord for your great sacrifice Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is the of death. death. And, and we join him in bringing up to earth. Am I in here? Oh, okay. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. We're moving into a deeper look. For those of you who don't know, we do this segment called A Deeper Look every week that we meet online. It's a way for people to get a deeper look into those in our community so you can get to know each other um, in this kind of fun way where we ask three questions um, and a bonus question. This sermon series, we are interviewing the preachers because the preachers are basically revisiting old sermons and we want to know why. So we have three questions specific to this series. Matthew's preaching this morning, and I'll go ahead and ask you the first question. Yeah. It is, why? Why did you choose the, the sermon of all the sermons you've ever preached to revisit? Which is kind of a fun assignment to get to do, yeah. right? It is. It is. But then there's this pressure of like, okay, you get a second go at it. It better be freaking awesome this time. You know, <laughs> trying to shake that pressure off but it's the story of the garrison demoniac the one who like jesus encounters and he's like we are legion and jesus casts them out the, the demons and they go into the the herd of pigs you know and um this is perhaps one of my favorite stories because i can really relate to this guy he is so tortured um, he's so isolated, disconnected from community, and it looks like his whole community has broken down. I see myself at times with my own struggles. I literally see family members in him. 
I see family systems in, in this whole situation. And so I love him. I also love Cain, who at the beginning of our Bible is driven away from community and is tortured as well. They're just such thick characters. They have such strong needs for spiritual and mental health. And they're both disconnected from life giving community. And like Christopher said, our wounds come in community, but our healing comes in community as well. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by them. And I, I just got to put this in here as well. I'm always a bit anxious when I preach about texts like this because I choose to interpret it metaphorically uh, rather than literally. Literal, you know, uh, evil spirit possession. That's a choice I've made this morning. Um, I'm not saying it has to be one or the other. But I'm just saying this morning I've chose to interpret it metaphorically. Um, and it always brings me some anxiety because spiritual communities I've been a part of in the past, um, they were really invested in only interpreting texts like this in my yeah. mind. So I wrestle with that as as I work with texts like this. Yeah. Yes. Such it's such a good opportunity to have this space to give some like heads up, but we don't get to do this usually. <laughs> Right. We preach. Um, right. So why did you choose this sermon of all the, wait, was that the question? No. Yeah, no, we just, just did that one. That. <laughs> what changes did you make? Did you make changes? Um, yeah, just some. How I many changed, years uh, the, has it been? Since, I can't, was it like 2019 or something like that? I think that's right. So a couple of years, yeah. Um, I changed the intro and the conclusion. I update you know, some of the examples to be more recent, but the big idea remains the same that this man is not just sick or ill or demon possessed, but his whole system is sick. And Jesus wants to attend to both him and the whole system that he's in. As a budding social worker, we have this phrase person in environment, like we're kind of focused on the person and the environment they're in and we want health in all of that. Yeah. Um, well, how have you evolved? Since writing oh it my gosh, look, look, as one of my dearest friends, you know, I'm on this journey of growth and evolution. And, and, I, and I certainly have grown a lot and, and evolved a lot since then. I think these days more about locally and local culture um, and just how rich and resilient a local community, whether it's a church or a neighborhood or a town or a city or whatever it can be. I think a lot about that these days. I think a lot about systems. I'm really focused on systems. I'm kind of this weird mix of believing strongly in both personal responsibility, like really highly in that, but also critiquing systems that might inhibit or promote freedom and growth. You know, so I, I think about systems a lot. I read uh, in the past year, I read Eric Fromm's The Sane Society. He was a mid 20th century philosopher. And uh, so The Sane Society. and uh, one of the, one of the quotes from that book is that he says the danger of the past is that we might have become slaves, but the danger of the future is that we might become robots. Um, and I'll add to that the danger of the present and the future is that, in my view, we might become mindless livestock. We're farmed as mindless consumers and slaughtered by hidden domination systems. For example, you'll hear me critique uh, very often the affluent environmentalism of our age where we're told if you'll just consume more virtuously, if you'll just go buy that electric vehicle, you will save the environment. Um, rather than saying, let's let's look at our patterns of, patterns of consumption on a fundamental level and our dependence uh, on next day Amazon shipments and what is that doing to our soul? So um, yeah, I think a lot about these kinds of systems as well. So that's some of the wow. evolution yeah. I've been through. I don't know, Matt. You were only supposed to do one sermon this morning. No. <laughs> Just keep it, keep, rain it in. Just I'll kidding. stop there. <laughs> There's a bonus question, and it's oh, no. submitted by Miles, and he wants to know how would 20 year old Matt have reacted to the original version of this sermon? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would have not just thought literally about it, but insisted on literalism in its in its interpretation of of the demoniac. And again, that was because of the spiritual community I was a part of at the time. So that's who would have thought of the text. And I would have been really confused by the sermon, like, hey, why, why isn't he talking about casting out literal demons um, and pathologizing just this man with his demons? And why isn't there an altar call at the end? There's something missing from his, 
from his sermon right here. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a real sermon without a good altar call. Ah, uh, 20 year old Matt, we'd all love to see him. You know, he needs a lot of hugs and I still give him a lot of hugs. Uh, Absolutely. He gets scared. He's still inside and scared sometimes. And I'm like, hey, it's okay. I got it. <laughs> it's gonna be all right. God is bigger than you thought. So just trust that. Yeah, love that. Well, thank you, Matthew. We'll look forward to hearing from you. And actually, we're going to stay um, on the screen here because I think we have a, a prayer next that we're going to read together. But thanks for sharing with us. Thank you. Yeah, so this is this is a little bit different approach. I love it. And I think it fits in really well with what Matt was just saying. Uh, it's a a different approach to thinking about the indwelling and being one with God or God invading our life, but it's not the literal kind of thing that Matt, like Matt was saying. So I'll, as you will, I'll read the, the lighter font, the basic one, and y'all read the bolder, the darker one. Be our primary disease. Yeah. Be our night visitor. And haunt and us. Haunt us. Be our moth that consumes and eat and away. Be, away our our freedom. Freedom. Be our primary disease. Our night, our night, night or or our moth. Our Infect, haunt, eat away until we are toward you and with you and for you. Away, away from our, our, our anti peace. Our unfreedom, more like you and less like your resistance. In the name, in the name of the Lord, 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 Lord. most with you, most for you, even Jesus. Amen. 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 Good morning. This is a reading from Ephesians 6 10 through 18. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. We are not fighting against human enemies, but against rulers, authorities, forces of cosmic darkness, and spiritual powers of evil in the heavens. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day, and after you have done everything possible to still stand. So stand with the belt of truth around your waist the justice as your breastplate and put shoes on your feet so that you are ready to spread the good news of peace. Above all, carry the shield of faith so that you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. Offer prayers and petitions in the spirit all the time. Stay alert by hanging in there and praying for all believers. We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here this morning. And as I said, I have the great joy of speaking this morning about one of my favorite gospel texts, if not my favorite gospel story. Uh, it's about the man possessed by the legions of demons. I'm sure you've seen him portrayed in movies and stories and things like that. And it's never, it's ne it, it probably highly pathologizes him. Uh, but I want to take a different take on it this morning. Let me read the text for us, though. It's found in Luke 8, 26 through 39. And it reads, Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but he lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, 
for many demons had entered him. They, be they begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave, please, for God's sake, just leave us. For they were seized with great fear. So he got in the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged Jesus that he might stay with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. We hear the voice of God in the reading of these beautiful be to God. I recently had a discussion with a friend about the latest Roe v. Wade decision. Yeah, we're just jumping right in here. <laughs> For years, she's been actively involved in advocacy and efforts to fight for not just reproductive rights, but for rights, freedoms, and social justice more broadly. This has been her life. And at one point in our discussion, she was distraught. She was weeping and she was sharing how, and I quote her here, we've let our aunts, our mothers, and our grandmothers down. We have failed them. We're a disappointment. Everything they fought for, we just let slip away. I listened with empathy, hearing her grief, but I was troubled by what she was saying about failing our aunts and mothers and grandmothers. Now, it's not always wise for a guy to critique a woman grieving about the loss of her bodily autonomy. So it's not. So I knew I was on really thin ice there, but I was troubled by what she was saying. I was troubled by the way that she was pathologizing herself as having done wrong in this decision outcome. I was troubled by the way she was taking tremendous responsibility for the small-minded choices of politicians. I was troubled by the way she wasn't taking into account the way that our unique democracy, which is shaped by gerrymandering, dehumanizing culture wars, voter disenfranchisement for massive groups of our citizens, Christian nationalism, she, none of this was part of the context of that decision for her. She had all turned it inward. I was troubled by the multi-decade cultural decline that we are experiencing right now in real time. And it's come as a result of bankrupting our financial systems and shipping our livable wage jobs overseas for many of our many of those in our population and how we have bankrupted our human capital systems, having sent some of the best of who we are off to a two-decade war in impoverished foreign lands. I was just troubled that she took all of these systemic failures, which in my mind contribute to this moment we're living in right now and getting these kinds of absurd, tragic decisions. And she took all that blame and she was putting on herself. I, we have failed our grandmothers, mothers, and aunts. And so I said to her, I hear your anger and heartbreak, but I'm not so sure that you failed them. For years, you've continued in their legacy of fighting. And it seems to me that a mea culpa right now, some self-blame is not what's needed. What we need instead is a clear-eyed assessment and critique of our political and legal systems of how power is hoarded and weaponized by a few. I could hear her grief, but I refuse to join her in her self-blame for a system functioning exactly as it was darkly designed. Now, as we turn, whether or not you agree with, with my challenge of her in that moment, we can talk about that later. That would be a fun conversation. But let's turn toward our biblical story and our biblical character, the demoniac, as he's called. And I find myself thinking similar thoughts. We often pathologize individuals, pathologize ourselves, rather than asking if this person's behaviors and mental state, if they are instead a symptom of the system's illness. Is the person ill because they're bad? 
or are they ill because they live in an ill system? Is diabetes and obesity purely an individual problem with individual causes? Or is there a systemic problem like the fact that some populations live in food deserts or maybe their rich and diverse food culture was intentionally destroyed and replaced with government rations of flour, salt, and lard, as was the case with Native Americans forcibly removed from their rich ecosystems and given these three rations and told you need to live on these now. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like us to exercise our imagination, think about systems, and I want us to do a little time traveling. Imagine with me that this man is not the Gerasene demoniac, the demoniac from uh, Gerasa in ancient Syria, but instead he's just a man or a person like you and me. And we don't find him, as our text says, on the other side of Galilee, which kind of has these on the other side of the tracks feels to it. But instead, we find him in Gerasa, USA, today. He's our neighbor. He's here living with us. He isn't the demoniac from a small town in ancient Syria. He's you and me and our neighbor in Gerasa, the town next to us. And that's where we find him, as if he were a character in a dystopian movie. He's naked, alone, obvious psychological instability and mental health illness. How did he get to this place where he is, to use some theological language, experiencing a complete crisis of soul? If you look at the worship guide this morning, I included a quote of how I think about soul, and it comes from Dr. Rogers Vaughn, but he said, soul is that fabric that embeds every one of us within all that is. Soul is our existence within the woven living web of humanity and all creation. And that being said, souls do not simply become ill or fail to thrive from within. Instead, they become frayed when the broader fabric in which they exist becomes torn, strained, and destroyed. Is that how our man became naked alone and living in a cemetery? The broader fabric of his society had become frayed, torn, strained, and destroyed. The way Matthew tells the story, he was so violent, it wasn't even safe to pass through the area where he was. The way the Gospel of Mark tells the story, he would cut himself with stones and scream out night and day. Both his soul and the soul fabric of his community was clearly torn, and the only option they had was to try to bind him with chains, and that didn't work. And they had no other options, no other choices. Their divine imagination, that piece of the soul fabric, was also torn. Have you wondered, why does he cut himself? The way Mark tells the story, he cuts himself and he screams out day and night. Imagine living with him on the outskirts of your town. Why this self-harm? If Garassa, USA, the town next to us where he lives, is a typical U.S. town, then one in five people there uh, are intentionally harming themselves at any moment um, higher if you're a teenager, and even higher still, if you're a teenage young woman, and girl. But they are trying to cope with the incredible spiritual and mental pain that they are feeling. These feelings often include anger, shame, grief, guilt, and self-hate. These kinds of feelings of which you know what the medicine is? A robust, healthy community. That's what the medicine would be. But tr tragically, the crisis of soul in our society means that it's becoming harder and harder to find that kind of medicine, this medicine of local community where one deeply knows others and is deeply known by others. That's the medicine needed and the medicine that's missing. And instead, we filled this soul medicine vacuum with social media and consumer goods and bespoke experiences, but it's a poor substitute. Maybe like me, you also wonder why he's living among the tombs. What's he doing living in a cemetery? Could be, it could be, we're using our imagination this morning. It could be that someone he loved, someone who helped hold his world together had died and is buried there in that cemetery. And the soul of his community has so disintegrated that there's no communal rituals anymore to help him mourn and give him a structure, a fabric in which to process tremendous grief, perhaps while having significant mental health challenges. Perhaps there's no permission 
to suffer well. And so he wanders aimlessly deeper and deeper into the starless no man's land of grief wilderness. Where is his community among the living? To make matters worse, again, if he's like any one of our neighbors in this town, uh, perhaps he wasn't born there. Perhaps he found himself there instead after many moves throughout the years, seeking degrees at various educational institutions or seeking a livable wage job. So you, you are forced to move from place to place. And I, I read, uh, I've read reports from the Federal Reserve and others who says, you know, if you want to get a livable wage job, you have to uproot, uproot yourself from a community and go to where that work is. But there are hundreds of thousands of people going to flock to that one job as well. And they don't really address that or they don't address the fact that um, you have to lose community. You have to lose your soul, I would say. So perhaps he has been hopping around his whole life just looking to make a living, following his career perhaps, and this left him without living, breathing community. I met someone like him one night. I was on call at the hospital. Uh, it's one of the saddest nights I've ever had as a hospital chaplain. An elderly woman followed the ambulance in that brought her husband to the emergency department with chest pains. After 45 minutes of CPR and every possible intervention, the doctor called it. Her husband was gone. I sat with her for the next few hours, and at one point I asked her, who can we call? No one, she said. A daughter, a sibling, a friend, is there anyone I can call? No one. I have no one. We, we followed his career all over the place. It was just us. He was all I had, she said. And soon after that, I carried a white plastic bag with all his belongings. I walked her to her car. I was heartbroken knowing that she was going home to an empty house. She didn't have the spiritual and psychological safety net of a living, breathing community. And she was dangerously close to being overcome like our man in this story. In fact, researchers have recently said that loneliness and social isolations, they are more dangerous to our health than smoking and obesity. They said it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of mortality and the impact on our bodies. The soul of a community, the fabric of a community absolutely matters. We could say that this breakdown of soul is equal to what's been called third order suffering. Go, this is nerdy. Stick with me a few more minutes. Third order suffering. First order suffering, it's categorized as suffering that we experience because we're mortal. We are limited creatures. We all get sick. We all die. We all are not going to fare very well in a tornado or a hurricane uh, or a pandemic or, or whatever. First order suffering. Then there's second order suffering. Second Second order suffering is what we experience because of the injustices and the harm that we caused to one another. A gunman commits a mass shooting. A person drives drunk and kills somebody. Uh, the builder for your house didn't build it according to code, so it crashes down. Second order suffering comes because of what we do to each other. But then there is third order suffering as well. Uh, and this is suffering we experience because we have dismantled community. We have dismantled our support systems. They are fraying from neglect or they've been intentionally dismantled or destroyed. And you know what I'm thinking about right now? I'm thinking about President Reagan in the 1980s telling lies about so-called welfare queens so that he could dismantle social safety nets for vulnerable populations. I'm thinking about uh, when Jana led our, our Dig Deep session on immigration and she taught us how immigration was at a 40-year low when this became uh, a hot topic button political tool in 2015, and we made that whole process intentionally more nasty. Uh, I'm thinking of the dismantling of Roe versus Wade. I'm thinking about these third order suffering things where we undo intentionally community and we contribute to suffering of people because we are taking it apart. This is a crisis of our communal soul. Now, we could go on giving reasons why someone would find themselves like our man here, naked alone and living among the tombs. Who knows what, what it was? We don't know. These many causes of suffering are, we could say, to use the word from our text, legionists, legions. 
There's too many of them to name. The name legion in our text refers to a legion or a brigade of 6,000 Roman soldiers occupying, controlling, exploiting, doing whatever their whims so desire, killing the inhabitants. And one of the symbols of these Roman brigades was a pig. <laughs> Remember the swine in the story? It's a pig is one of the symbols of the legions. And so when he says that forces are controlling him and they're named legion, he very well could mean that they are seemingly omnipresent or everywhere, like the Roman occupation was. Uh, they are seemingly omnipotent. They can get away with whatever they want to do. They are seemingly omniscient. They, are, they know everything, it seems. They are legion, meaning everywhere he turns, the system that he's living in is claiming for itself these attributes that truly should belong only to God, but rather than nourishing him into life, they are leaving him naked, alone, and living among the dead. Can you see and hear his hopelessness? He is so hopeless and his crisis of soul is so great that when someone genuinely comes into his orbit, he begs Jesus to leave. What do you have to do with me? And Jesus says, what is your name? And he can't even say his own name anymore. He can't even say the name given to him by community. He can't even say, I am mother, I am son, I am Jet, I am Carissa. Instead, he gives the name that the system has given him. I am Legion. I am Tomb Dweller. I am Cutter. His labels and his diagnosis have become his name, his identity, his being, his everything. And the system doesn't flinch. Jesus doesn't flinch. He looks right in the man's eyes as if he were a person, and he sees more than this name given to him by the system. He sees more than someone who lives close to pigs or among the dead or that he's Gentile, all these things that would make him ritually unclean, right? Jesus looks past all of that, and he sees a child of God ensnared in a system of dehumanization. Jesus destroys all his categories of who is in and who is out, right? Right? and who is defiled and who is clean. He, we would say in Garasa USA today, he destroyed all the labels of gay or straight or immigrant or citizen or employed or unemployed or Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, Republican, Democrat, libertarian. He destroys all of these labels and looks right past and sees the man. And as a result, the man is set free. A few concluding thoughts on this. First, the townspeople are so freaked out at this man's healing that they beg Jesus to leave. And we have to ask ourselves, why is their system so committed to him being an ill person that they can't stand it when he's whole? That his wholeness is somehow threatening to them. Maybe you can relate. Some of us come from families and communities that box us in, and they are over-invested in us being in that box, us being sick, us being ill, and our growth is threatening to them. It's kind of true what they say. I may be 40 when I'm in my home here today, but I'm 35 when I leave my driveway, and I'm 30 when I get to my hometown, and I'm 25 when I get to my neighborhood, and I'm 20 when I get to the street I grew up on, and then I'm 15 when I get back to my childhood front door. It's hard to break those interpersonal dynamics, that system that expects us to behave in certain ways and doesn't want us to grow and change. And I know this resonates with some of you. I can understand why the man begs Jesus to take him along. But again, doing what I can only call divine here, Jesus doesn't take him along. Jesus sends him back to his community. This is crazy, right? This is my last point. I want you to hear it. Jesus tells the guy to stay. Although he would be living among those who fear his newfound wholeness, Jesus tells the guy to stay as if that one encounter with someone who called forth his imago day contained enough grace for a lifetime. Jesus tells the guy to stay as if salvation is more than one individual getting free from legion and following him. Salvation involves community. Salvation involves repairing the torn fabric of our interwoven lives. Salvation involves creativity and courage to integrate those that it would rather cast out. Salvation involves going back to a community that thinks a herd of pigs is worth more than one healthy, whole, restored person because they themselves are also profoundly bound by chains. 
This is beautiful. And I can't help but think about our community here at Peace. We are a decade into our work together. We are a decade into this work of intentional community, uh, dismantling notions of misogyny and racism and heterosexism and religious fundamentalism and all the other soul-destroying parts of life here in our own Gerasa, USA. And a lot of us have found tremendous freedom. Yes, that's what we want. We, are no, we, we no longer live among the tombs of harmful theology. We're no longer bound by the heavy chains of post-war 1950s evangelicalism. I know that's been freedom I've experienced. But what now? So many of us say, I want to leave. Goodbye. I'm going with Jesus. I'm leaving all you crazies. And when the demons are gone, the man begged Jesus to go with him. But Jesus sent him back saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And here at peace, as we have done this incredible liberating work with God, may we find a way to stay and continue to do this incredible liberating work in this community and in those 36 instances of community that we take with us everywhere we go, believing that freedom will come to all those communities. Amen. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round and you can't find the fighter but I see it in you so we're gonna walk it out and move mountains we're gonna walk it out and move And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day, I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid, I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. I'll rise up high like the waves, I'll rise up in spite of the ache, I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. For you, for you, for you, for you. When the silence isn't quiet and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe, and I know you feel like dying, but I promise we'll take the Take the world to its feet and move mountains. And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day, I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid, I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again for you.
can I run tech and do the benediction at the same time? Yes, I can. Um, great. Hey, I'm Jet Anderson. I'll be closing it out with the benediction as I bring it up. But a couple of things I wanted to uh, get to some announcements uh, that we didn't get at the top of the hour. Uh, there's going to be a youth retreat. Uh, also, it's in the email list. A bunch of these announcements are in the email list, but just wanted to go over them. Uh, just in case, so August 7th, there was a date change. It'll be at Pine House Pizza, pick up and drop off uh, for our uh, Peace Youth. Uh, in two weeks, we'll have our next in-person gathering, uh, July 31st. Uh, and then last uh, but not least, I'll be blasting out a community survey, a link to that. I'll uh, try and post that uh, in the comments, but I'll also be posting in our you know, local Facebook group and we'll make a graphic and stuff and put it out on uh, both email and uh, Facebook, uh, our regular Facebook group as well. Um, so with that, I'll bring up the benediction. Smooth, okay, um, awesome. Well, Lord, you are ascending God. You sent your word to create. You sent Christ to reveal. You sent your spirit to empower. You sent your church to proclaim. Send us, O oh God, to renew the earth. Lead us by your spirit and your word. As your people, we now go. By our community, we'll make you known. People of God, you are sent. Go in peace for peace. Amen. Okay.